Charting Toward Intimacy covers mature topics. Listener discretion is advised. Charting Toward Intimacy covers mature topics. Listener discretion is advised. Hey there, welcome to Charting Toward Intimacy, where we're expanding the natural family planning conversation. I'm your host, Ellen Holloway. In today's episode, we are talking natural family planning and cycle pain and how those two go together and also when the church actually does allow birth control um, and what circumstances that is um, and and also what you need to think about um, if that is something you are considering um, and what that really means, what, that, what the church is okay with birth control really does mean. I do want to mention before we get started, this episode was recorded at six in the morning. My time, I was not fully awake yet. Um, we, at one point in the episode, were talking about a normal amount of ibuprofen to be able to mitigate period pain. Um, and I mentioned 200 to 300 milligrams um, is a good baseline, but that number actually is 400 to 600 milligrams. Um, a normal ibuprofen pill is 200 milligrams. So that's about two to three um, ibuprofen pills. I also do just want to say this again, um, that this is not, uh, this episode is not supposed to be a diagnostic tool. Um, this is just information for you. Um, if you are concerned about anything that we talk about on this episode, talk to either your NFP instructor or your doctor. Those are going to be the people that are going to give you the best information. And on that, let's get started. All right. We are welcoming Mary Bruno to the podcast. Mary, I'm so excited to have you here. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks. Can you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself and then we'll jump in? Sure. So my name is Mary, as you just mentioned. I am from New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, Now I'm living on the North Shore, just north of New Orleans. And I've been married to my husband, Chris, for eight years. And we have a beautiful adoptive daughter. Her name is Bella. She is going to be five soon. And we're in the process of the, of, uh, the adoption process again, waiting to welcome a new little baby into our home, hopefully soon. Oh, um, fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I'm a Creighton practitioner and I, uh, I founded Taking Back the Terms and co-founded Fanbase most recently. That is awesome. Awesome. So today we are talking about, um, we're talking a little bit about healthy cycles. We're also going to talk a little bit about, um, birth control and, um, and really the fact that, um, when the church is asking us to use natural family planning in order to plan our family, the church is not also just blanketing a statement of, Well, you just need to accept it if you have lots of pain or if you have uh, different cycle issues. That's not what the church is saying when she's asking us to uh, use a natural method of family planning. So we're going to discuss that in a couple of different ways. So, so first off in a really basic way, let's, let's just kind of start by defining like, what is a healthy cycle? And there is such a range, um, Mm -hmm. you know, we're going to, we're just going to kind of scratch the surface on this, um, this is, this is not a diagnostic tool. Right. Please, don't, <laughs> please don't listen to this don't podcast and go, diagnose yourself. <laughs> wait a second. <laughs> yeah. So let's define a healthy cycle. Yeah. Okay. So first off, like looking at the cycle length alone, which is from one period until the next period starts, that's a full cycle length. Is that enough information to tell us whether or not the cycle is healthy? I mean, you could have a healthy cycle range somewhere around 20 days to 40 days or so, but there's some other things that we need to consider as well. Mm-hmm. So um, each cycle has a pre-ovulatory phase and a post-ovulatory phase. The pre-ovulatory phase can be variable in length because we don't know when ovulation is going to occur, right? So um, the follicular phase occurs during the pre-ovulatory phase that follicle develops the egg. It also produces estrogen, which produces cervical mucus. So cervical mucus means is is one thing, one factor of a healthy cycle. Um, Typically women see five or six days of, of cervical mucus in a cycle, but that can vary from woman to woman and from cycle to cycle. But if there's dramatically less than that, that can indicate some, some risk factors. Also, the length of the luteal phase is something else that's important to look at. 
um, a normal range of length or the post ovulatory phase is the luteal phase ranges from nine to 17 days, but the individual woman should remain pretty consistent in the length of her, her post ovulatory phase. So if that's really short, then that's another sign that maybe something isn't, isn't very healthy. Also, uh, pain, of course, is another indicator of something that is not right. As you just mentioned, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really not normal to have anything more than moderate to severe pain with our cycles. We should not be having a lot of pain in between our cycles. It is normal during ovulation to feel some pain on one side, um, even have some cramping. But our pain should not be affecting our ability to function our, in our daily lives. And I think that's the best indicator. Like, you know, for me, I know in my experience, I had a lot of pain with my period growing up and um, into my young adult years. And it was just kind of this unspoken rule that girls deal with it. And that's what we're working against here is that that is not normal. And if we continue to tell women that it's normal, then we won't get them diagnosed. We won't get them treated holistically, like actually addressing the underlying problem. Right. Well, and like, I remember just from personal experience, like in high school, um, one time I, I was in cross country and, you know, so I'm running and it's like, either my period was about to start or it just started or something. And so I was just having a really pretty rough day, quite a bit of pain. Um, and I had mentioned that to my coach of just like, I'm just really not like feeling it today. And I am, I have a lot of pain and I was literally told like, well, you need to manage that you're on a cross country team. Like, like you can you just turn to, it off, right? Yeah. You need to show up for practice and be prepared and it doesn't matter what's going on. Like, <laughs> I'm like, geez, <laughs> yeah, the lack of awareness and education in the culture is really not helping women at all. It's no. just silencing them and it, therefore silencing what might be happening underneath the surface. And it's really sad. Right. Right. Well, and I have been really blessed to, to deal with pretty typical pain. Mine has been um, completely manageable with ibuprofen, which I've also heard that it's like, if you can manage your pain with an, you know, a, a regular amount of ibuprofen, that would be, you know, 200 to 300 milligrams, um, four to six hours mm -hmm. every four to six hours. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, then that, that is like typical pain. Um, sure. but if, if your pain is not manageable with right. ibuprofen, then that is an indicator of there's something else that we need to address and look into. Absolutely. And that is, that's a good indicator for sure. I've been told, so it, and it's hard to look. So one of the most common causes of painful periods is a disease called endometriosis, which a lot of people have heard of. It affects one in 10 women. Um, now, many times it causes pain, but not all the time. Mm. So we can't rule it out if there's no pain, but frequently we can say, okay, is this, if the pain is enough, it's worth getting it checked out basically. And a lot of people don't want to hear it, but it is a surgical disease. It just is. Um, so my surgeon had, and I'm not saying everybody needs to go have surgery, but, um, but I'm saying if the pain is severe enough, then it's time to just have a consult. Like, let's mm -hmm. just look into it. And so my surgeon has told me, um, if 600 milligrams of ibuprofen every six hours doesn't manage the pain, it's time to see a surgeon. So yeah. I've kind of used that as a, as a pretty good baseline. And the beauty of charting too, is that most women who chart can predict when their period will start where we're, we're right. generally aware. And so he has also told me to begin the, the ibuprofen a day before the period, the, uh, the pain starts. So yes. for me, I always knew like when my period was coming or like that the worst of it would be like the first day or two. So it's kind of hard to start taking it when there's no pain, but that way we can get ahead of it. Right. Well, and, and that's, that has been my own experience in the past too. Again, I've, I've only, um, suffered from just kind of very manageable pain, but, um, it would be the, the first feeling of just minor, minor cramping. If I took 
the ibuprofen, if I took 400 milligrams of ibuprofen, I was good to go. And then I would just kind of stick on it for about a day, maybe two days, um, every six hours or so. Um, and, and then I would be good to go. But if I missed it, and I let it get to a point where I was definitely, uh, cramping and, and had more severe pain. Um, there was very little I could do. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. Like if you don't get it ahead of time, you really do notice how much worse it gets. So yeah, I get that, uh, those anti-inflammatories in on time. <laughs> <laughs> it's very interesting, but yeah, it naturally, if you really think about it, there's a lot of inflammation going on. Yeah. Um, in that area of the body. And so that's what ibuprofen is doing is it is um, kind of uh, mitigating that inflammation. And that inflammation is what's really causing that cramping um, among other things, but generally. <laughs> so, so on this podcast, we've talked about how NFP is sometimes a cross. We've talked about how marriage is a cross. Um, and as Catholics, we are called to take up our crosses. Um, However, there are parts of NFP and the female fertility cycle that are not crosses um, we should have to take up. Um, so we've talked a little bit about pain. So let's let's kind of discuss that a little bit more. What um, first off, like why why is this prevalent that we should just take up this cross of of right. unresolved pain or some other issue with our cycle? I think that's a really good point because when the church is endorsing NFP they're talking about only reasons to avoid pregnancy, right? That's what Mm -hmm. they're talking about. They're not talking about those other health reasons. So remember like birth control, for example, is prescribed for multiple different reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, It's, it's prescribed for avoiding pregnancy, but also if there are any cycle irregular, irregular, I'm sorry, I can't speak (laughs) irregularities. It is a tough word Um, or pain or acne. I mean, across the board. Um, So that's not what the church is referring to. The church actually does allow a woman to use birth control if it is for the sole reason of, uh, for, for, for taking away pain or some type of symptom. If the goal is not to avoid pregnancy. Now we have to pay attention to a couple of other details though, in this scenario, if sex is um, something that is, is being had, then that, that brings up another variable because, uh, birth control is an abortifacient. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the woman or the couple does need to take that into consideration. So, so, and I'm going to explain the mechanism of action a little bit of birth control and how that works, why that is the fact. So birth control works in a few different ways. One of the things it does is it thickens up or changes the the quality of the cervical mucus to make it very difficult for sperm to penetrate um, the vagina in and of itself. But that's not 100%. Sometimes sperm still get through, right? The other mechanism of action is that it suppresses ovulation. It introduces synthetic hormones, which means our body stops producing our normal hormones that are actually very healthy for us, but they also trigger ovulation. So it suppresses ovulation. Now, again, though, that is not 100% of the time. So what I want to read you to give you a better idea of how frequently breakthrough ovulation can occur on the pill. um, There's one of my textbooks called Reproductive Anatomy and Physiology. This is written by Dr. Thomas Hilgers. Um, I'm just going to read this little section to it because I think it's fascinating. The mechanism whereby the inhibition of implantation occurs by suppression of normal endometrial development is an abortifacient action of the oral contraception. This occurs when ovulation is not inhibited by the oral contraceptive. Exactly how often this occurs is not known at the present time, but it's estimated that For the standard oral contraceptive, it may range from a low of 1.7% to 28.6% per cycle. Whoa. It gets worse. For the progestin-only contraceptives, so some people take the progestin-only to decrease the amount of synthetic hormones being introduced into the woman's system, Mm -hmm. but that also means the ability of it to suppress ovulation is increased. 
So breakthrough ovulation with the progestin only may range from 33 to 65%. Whoa. Cycle. So it's, it's pretty amazing that that, that that can happen. The whole idea is, so when, when birth control was first introduced, it had a, a whole lot more synthetic hormones in it, mm-hmm. but they saw how unhealthy it was. It was like, like a lot of bad things were happening. So over the years, they have decreased the amount of synthetic hormones in it, but that means that backup, the backup mechanism, um, if so, if ovulation is not, the reason this is abortifacient, I didn't finish that statement, is that when breakthrough ovulation occurs, pregnancy can occur. Mm -hmm. So the backup mechanism of birth control is that it thins up the lining of the uterus that is typically healthy and rich to support that new embryo. Well, it takes that away. Mm-hmm. So if the baby is conceived, it, it has a very hard time implanting on the lining of the uterus. And that's a backup mechanism because they're aware that breakthrough ovulation can occur. Sperm can sometimes get through anyway. So, wow. yeah. And then the IUD, the IUD is another thing to consider the, the, um, the mechanism of action of the IUD has become somewhat confusing. I'm reading from the book again, because (laughs) the emphasis has been placed upon its contraceptive effects. However, it continues to have an abortive action. A recent review um, suggests that the prevention of implantation still is the main mechanism of action. Wow. So it doesn't really matter what kind of hormonal birth control is being used. It is possible for breakthrough ovulation to occur, which means that baby's life can be ended. Yes. So again, it doesn't. So uh, we just have to consider that and be informed if we're using birth control and also having sex. And we do have another option, um, okay. which also, even if a woman, if it's still important, if she believes she needs to be on birth control, um, a woman can actually chart while she's on birth control. If she's taking the birth control to reduce severe symptoms, if she's charting for, with Creighton, for example, that's the only experience I have with Creighton charting. So I want to only speak to that, right. but a woman will be able to Um, identify signs of ovulation, even if she's on the pill, if she's charting and a couple can avoid uh, sex during times of fertility. So I think that's really interesting. I actually have one client now, um, a friend of mine who is also a practitioner has had a couple of clients using birth control and also charting at the same time. I have just started a client actually on the IUD. She is removing her IUD in a couple of months. Um, but the first cycle charted, I have already, she has already identified a time of fertility. It's, it was amazing for me to actually see it in real time that she had several days of peak type mucus. We were able to identify a peak day. Wow. It was on IUD. Yeah. That is crazy. Now, uh, from my experience, I'm a symptothermal instructor. Um, this, this would probably only be possible on a mucus only method. Yeah. Um, now that the symptothermal method does have, um, mucus only options for right. specific times, like for example, like postpartum, um, postpartum time until the return of, <clears throat> excuse me, until the return of, uh, cycling, um, is basically a mucus only method. Um, right. so that would be possible, but, um, right. Because, because the death drone wouldn't be being produced and causing the temp shift. Exactly. Yeah. So, and that temperature rise is an important part of, uh, right. the rules and the calculations. So, um, if you're curious about that, look into a mucus only method, right. uh, first, that would probably be your best bet. Um, yeah, let, let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, in, the use of hormonal birth control, um, you know, we've, we've also talked on the podcast and we probably will talk on the podcast again about just the, uh, the dangers of birth control, the, um, the, the lies that the <laughs> big pharma industry tells us about what birth control does and doesn't do. Um, and I just want to stress that again, because I don't think we can stress it enough that, um, 
just because a doctor says, this is what you have to do um, to mitigate some uh, medical issue, whether that is pain or irregular uh, cycling or acne or something else. Um, there is often another option. There is often, um, a healthier option too. And yes, we, we did want to, uh, acknowledge the fact that there are needs, um, in some cases for birth control. Um, and some women feel that that is the need that they have. Um, but I also want to stress that, uh, it's important to look into other options. Um, yeah. And those can be hard to find. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. The important thing to know is that we have options. It's important to be informed because a lot of, a lot of mainstream gynecologists don't know, or they don't trust the other options available. And they're not giving us all the information about birth control. So for example, as I explained, I had a lot of painful periods. I thought it was normal. So I didn't see a doctor until I was like, so old, they offered to give me birth control, but they gave me no information about it. Mm -hmm. I didn't, they just say like, this is something that will help with the symptoms. Um, but, and that's true. That's true. Like, as we have just discussed many times, birth control does help with the symptoms, but what they don't include is that it's not treating the underlying cause of the symptom. So it's, it's, it's very valuable to find a restorative reproductive medicine doctor because they don't prescribe birth control. And yes. the first time I learned of that, I was amazed. I was like, I'm sorry, what? There are doctors that exist that don't prescribe birth control. Isn't everyone like, isn't that something everyone does? Explain this to me. Where do I find these <laughs> doctors? <laughs> where, where? Tell me, please. Because even so, because when I first went to the doctor, like I never ended up taking birth control, even with the symptoms I was having, but I wasn't married yet. I wasn't having sex. It wasn't even for that reason. It was just that I didn't feel comfortable putting this thing into my body that I didn't understand. I didn't take a lot of medicine then. So for me, I just was left to deal with the symptoms. And my doctor mm -hmm. literally sent me on my way, just deal with it. Like there was no help. So um, I eventually discovered the Creighton model, which does have a medical and surgical extension. And the Creighton model chart is the foundation that gives the doctor direction um, and to, to treat the woman holistically in a, in a very, in a, in a wide range of ways, not just for pain. Uh, but just to tell you a little bit more about my experience, like I said, I've never been on birth control, but I, un my pain over the years has gotten so severe. I, I understand why many women feel like they need to, like they don't have any other options. Mm -hmm. I've been there. I've been to the emergency room on my cramp. So I understand it. And I, I think as long as we're taking the appropriate precautions of charting, if we're married, if we're having sex and avoiding intercourse when we're fertile, like I get that. I even considered it at first. I really did. And that's when I did all my research um, yeah. Yeah. after she, she prescribed it for me. Ultimately though, I learned I've learned enough of it over the years to know that I know too much, basically, like I cannot <laughs> break, I could never bring myself despite the amount of pain I was having to put that into my body. I could not bring it, bring myself to do it. Um, there are risk factors of cancer, of heart disease, of stroke, and that's not meant, uh, it takes away many women's libidos. Um, and that's not even including the uncomfortable side effects that we can have day to day. So many people don't want to be on birth control. Mm -hmm. Like that's just the fact they don't like what birth control does to them, but they don't know that we have these other options of restorative reproductive medicine. So now I had a severe case of endometriosis. I also had adenomyosis. So it was a lot, very complicated. I ended up having many surgeries and it wasn't until I really had my, my 10th surgery <laughs> that um just that diagnosed the adenomyosis that my pain really went away significantly but we need to find a doctor who knows so in medical school and in, in the, the typical you know basic surgeon instruction they don't go into detail how to remove endometriosis appropriately mm -hmm. like it's just a very because they prescribe birth control and they hope that that will just kind of manage the manage women that's what they've settled with. But there are physicians that go to extra training 
and they take a lot of extra time to appropriately remove the disease. So it has a very low recurrence rate. And again, birth control is not prescribed. So in all honesty, like as I'm waiting for these surgeries, I have been on narcotics. I have still felt the pains. I'd like, that's something that that was my decision that I chose to do just because again, I was informed and, and that's, that's what I felt like I needed to do until I was able to have, um, to find a good surgeon who could really take care of the disease for me. Yeah, definitely. I think a few weeks ago, you posted something on, um, on the taking back the terms, uh, Instagram, or it might've been on fan base. I'm not sure, but it was a, it was a really great analogy for using birth control, um, with endometriosis about getting a bead stuck in your oh, car. Yeah. Can you That's tell good. us that? That was so good. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it was basically, if I can remember it, this was a little while ago, but um, it was basically, I was comparing it to this one time I was driving my car. I, have, I used to have like a wooden rosary on my, um, my rear view mirror and I got stuck and I pulled it out and one of the beads popped off and got stuck in my air conditioning. I don't know if that's important to the story or not that detail, but um, man, it had, it caused this annoying noise in my air condition when it was on. And so the only way I could get, I, but I couldn't fit my fingers down the hole to get the, the thing yeah. out. So the only way I could stop the annoying noise was turn off my air condition. But that meant that I didn't get the air. The <laughs> noise went away. The annoying noise went away, but I didn't get the air. So I compare that to birth control because birth control, um, it does not, it, it doesn't address, it doesn't diagnose. It does not address the underlying issue causing the problem. It just shuts the whole system down. So shutting the system down will stop the sy symptoms. It'll stop the annoying noise or rattling mm -hmm. of that, that bead was causing, but we're not getting the air. We're not getting the good effects of, the, the, of, uh, of ovulation, which is the only thing that causes those hormones that are so good for our body. Did that even make sense at all? Yeah. <laughs> no, I read this. Um, you know, when, whenever you post it and I was like, oh my gosh, this is like the perfect analogy because like, what was the only way to remove the bead? Probably kind of like surgically, you would have That's to like right, remove have to pull apart the cart of the air conditioning unit to be able to get yeah. the bead out. And yeah. And, and the only way to kind of like turn off the noise was shutting the whole system down, which is what birth control does. So I just, I was like, wow, that's the most brilliant um, analogy I've ever I heard. I didn't even realize that about the surgery. That's, that's good. That was, that's all you. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um, yeah. I just, I I've told so many people that I was like, oh my gosh, I read this great analogy about oh, it. <laughs> that's awesome. I love it. Oh my gosh. Okay. So how can we, as, as individuals, kind of help to dispel this myth that if the church is calling us to NFP, then we just have to accept irregular and, and, or painful cycles. If we have them, how can we help to, um, get rid of that? Cause it's ridiculous. Yeah, I agree. I think it's awareness and conversations. NFP in and of itself is not something that is really discussed well enough in church and within Catholic communities. Like it's, we kind of have place these labels or these stereotypes over it. So if we don't improve these conversations, if we don't educate, you know, other women on what NFP is for and the values of it, like, I don't know how else we get rid of that stereotype, yeah. but it's just an understanding that again, the church endorses the most life-giving options. And that's what NFP is. When we're talking about spacing children, NFP or fertility awareness, as I prefer to refer it to is the most life-giving option. It's not speaking about the medical side of things. Mm -hmm. Um, so it has, it's not, that's what it's talking about spacing out children. Um, but the beauty of it is that in like, so for example, Dr. Hilgers in his pursuit of finding a, 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 a better, more ethical and moral way of spacing out children, um, by, by creating a, a, one of his natural family planning method, it was in that research to adhere to what Pope Paul VI was commanding in Humanae Vitae, mm -hmm. it was through that research, he discovered all these medical benefits. So it, 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 it was, it's just, again, when we pursue the most life-giving options, God 
but God blesses that. Like he gives us back so much more than he has taken away. The church is the most reasonable institution (laughs) on the planet. A lot of people don't understand that. And I get it. But again, that goes to what you're saying. A lot of people don't get that because they don't understand the church fully. They don't understand what NFP is. So I think it's just helpful. Let's be informed. Let's really, let's really take an interest and find out why the church teaches what she teaches. Let's go to the catechism. Let's talk to a priest that we trust that really knows his faith so that we can get these, get these, these misconceptions cleared up. We don't have to be angry at the church. Let's just understand why she says what she says, because Christ loves us. And that's why he's instituted the church because he loves us so much. So, oh, that's such a good point, Mary, because I I feel like it comes up all the time. It's like, well, you know, I, I stopped being Catholic because I don't agree with this. And it's like, well, do you know why, why we teach that? Why the church teaches that? Do you know what the background is of that? Um, And once you dive into it, I mean, every single, like, every single teaching that I've struggled with, with the Catholic church and, and I've struggled with plenty and I'm sure I will struggle with more in the future. Um, every single one has been cleared up. Um, maybe not on the timeline. I wanted it to be, Absolutely. Um, <laughs> but with either talking to, um, talking to a trusted priest or, um, you know, reading something in the Bible or hearing something on a podcast that like finally made it stick, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So just, uh, being open, being aware. And, and when you, when you come across, I mean, this is like not even contraception, um, NFP related. Like when you come across something you don't agree with in the Catholic church, like bring it to prayer, tell God, like, I'm not so sure about this. Mm-hmm. And he will provide the right people or the right resources in your life to explain that for you. Right. You just have to ser- search. You exactly. have to be seeking it. And that's what we should all be doing, seeking truth. But I love to say the church does not impose she proposes Mm. she doesn't force anybody to make these decisions she's only proposing the most life-giving options no one's forced to do anything we make our own decisions but it's helpful again like you're saying to look into all right well maybe i should try to understand why right we have total free will like that was something that god wanted for us to have this free will and to choose to love him and choose to follow. Um, yeah. And so that's, that's our choice is to choose to follow. Um, I did want to mention one more thing before we go, you had talked about, you know, how, um, however much, uh, God kind of, well, you said it so much better than this, but like, if God takes something away, he, he returns like, you know, triple fold or more. Um, and I just want to end on that because I I think it's beautiful, um, in that we are called to give everything to God. We are called to give our entire lives over to God, but that doesn't mean that God is going to take everything from us. Um, it means that we are saying thank you for the gift of our lives and the blessings that we've had. Thank you for the gift of my fertility. I'm giving it over to you, God. And then God returns and says, great, here are some great ways to manage it. Here are um, all these health benefits that are going to come right alongside that. Um, I want you to be happy. I want you to have, <laughs> honestly, God tells us, I want you to have a good sex life. That's um, right. It's true. <laughs> Absolutely. That's right. So it all returns um, to us more than what we give. That's right. Well, he can't be outdone in generosity. No, nope. just another way of saying. It. So, like you mentioned before, he gives us these crosses. We all have crosses. For me, it's been my biggest has been pain and infertility. But what you're, I think, what you're speaking to is that like God asks us to pick up and carry our cross. And yes, we can look at that and seeing, oh, that's only taking something away from me, but it never, as long as we like step into that and really give that to Christ and invite him into it, it will never take away more than it gives. And that's what I've experienced in my own life. Infertility and pain has given me way more than it has taken away. It's all about our perspective. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Great spot to end. Mary, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for the insight that you brought um, and and the textbook that you brought to to share those specific (laughs) statistics. That was really helpful for me. 
Um, and yeah, thank you so much. It, was there anything else you wanted to add before we close out? No, I just want to thank you for the gift of this podcast and all, all the ways that you're helping to, to keep us informed when it comes to NFP and charting. So thank you for having me. Awesome. Thanks so much for listening. Um, if you found this episode helpful, um, or if you have a friend who think would really benefit from this episode, please make sure to share it with them. Um, and if you are not already following us on Instagram, follow us at charting toward intimacy. If you have questions, concerns, episode topic ideas, please reach out to me. I love to hear from you guys. My email is in the show notes. Um, and you can also reach out to me on Instagram until next time.